Well, hey everybody, uh, welcome back for our second online lecture. This time we'll be covering chapter nine in your Oklahoma history textbook. We'll talk about the Civil War and Indian Territory. Now, we're gonna cover this chapter very quickly and I'm not even gonna cover section one of the chapter because that primarily is something we will cover next year uh, in US history and I've got a lot of detail, so I'm not gonna do that for this. But we will talk about some of the things that are specific to Indian Territory. However, let's start with uh, this day in history, uh, April 1st, 1918. The Royal Air Force was founded. Uh, this would be towards the end of World War I. The Royal Air Force would play a huge role for the British in World War II in helping stop the German bombing uh, during the Battle of Britain. In 1924, Adolf Hitler uh, was sent to jail on this day in history for his failed overthrow of the government in Munich, Germany. Um, so he was put in jail for that. He was supposed to spend five years in jail However, he was let out in less than a year. This day in history, 1789, you had the first Speaker of the House uh, who was elected, Frederick Augustus Conrad Muhlenberg was his name. Uh, part of the reason I like to bring this up is uh, his profession. He was a Lutheran minister, uh, and it just shows that you know, Christianity was very prevalent in early American history, and a lot of strong Christians, including ministers, were serving in government. This day in history, 1970, President uh, Richard Nixon banned cigarette ads on television and on radio. They could still do uh, ads in print, so in things like magazines or newspapers. In fact, when I was a kid, I remember seeing uh, ads in newspapers and magazines, primarily magazines. Uh, but by the time I was born, uh, they, I wasn't seeing them on TV or the radio, however. Uh, by 1970, uh, America was pretty aware of just how bad cigarettes were for you. Now, let's do some famous birthdays for April 1st. Otto von Bismarck. We talked about him last year in world history. Uh, very influential in unifying Germany. In fact, he's the singular person really responsible for that. He was a Prussian leader who eventually became the chancellor of Germany once it was unified. Susan Boyle uh, became famous on, I'm pretty sure it's Britain Got. Britain's, Britain's Got Talent, or whatever it's called. Uh, when she came out to sing, a lot of people weren't expecting a lot, but she uh, ended up having an incredible voice. Uh, she sang a song from Les Miserables. You guys probably know it. She became an internet sensation. Asa Butterfield is an actor. He plays Ender in Ender's Game. Samuel Alito is a current uh, member of the Supreme Court. So he's a justice on the Supreme Court, and he's a conservative justice. Our fun fact today, slugs have roughly 27,000 teeth. They routinely wear, routinely wear out and then lose them, but replace them by moving their back rows of teeth forward. Now that's just kind of almost a crazy thought, and they must be really small teeth considering they got 27,000 teeth in something as small as a slug. Um, imagine if a big animal though had 27,000 teeth, that'd actually be pretty, pretty creepy and pretty scary. So I'm glad, you know, that we don't see like elephants with 27,000 teeth or something like that. That would be uh, something to avoid for sure. Like I said, we're gonna cover the Civil War in Indian Territory very quickly. Well, one of the things that was important about the area of Oklahoma and Indian Territory were the resources that were in the territory, especially for the Confederacy who um, lacked a lot of the resources that the North had. Uh, Indian Territory was very desirable because of the horses, the cattle, good land to graze on for those animals. Um, grain, uh, also which could be used to feed the animals that would be serving in the Confederate Army. Uh, lead, now lead would be used obviously to make uh, the mini ball bullets for their muskets. Uh, so lead's very important and that was found in Oklahoma at this point in time. Salt to uh, dry meat and to make it to where you could have those types of provisions for soldiers. So the resources are very important. And just across the border to the south was the state of Texas, which joined uh, the Confederacy. Uh, on top of that, uh, as soon as the Civil War starts, you begin to see forts in Indian Territory be abandoned by the United States military. Uh, now, you might be like, wow, well, they're just giving up. Uh, they partly realized that the majority of the war was going to take place east of Oklahoma. So a lot of those soldiers were sent to fight in other areas of the war, but that kind of left Oklahoma open for the Confederates to take uh, control of the land. Now many 
Uh, people in the Indian tribes wanted to remain neutral, wanted to try out of the, try to keep out of the war, uh, because some of them knew, uh, a lot of them knew, joining the South's cause would cause them to lose a large amount of money that the U.S. government had promised them. Uh, however, many of them felt they had already been abandoned, uh, partly because they maybe hadn't got some of those payments, but also because the American military just abandoned those forts. So some of them were willing to join the Confederacy, uh, on top of the fact that it's going to be hard to not join them in the long run. So because there was no military presence, uh, U.S. military presence at least, the Indians had to basically accept the Confederacy as the Confederacy came into the territory. That or they had to try to fight the Confederacy on their own. So most, I'm not going to say all, but most Indian tribes end up joining the Confederacy, at least the majority of the tribes. Um, obviously, Texas sent a Brigadier General in Ben McCullough uh, to give command of Indian territory. He traveled to meet with John Ross, who was still the chief of the Cherokee during this time period. Uh, he urged Ross to sign a treaty with the Confederacy, but Ross refused to sign, saying the war would destroy his people, and he really didn't want to, quote, engage them in the white man's quarrel. Okay, so why get involved in a war that we really don't have much to do with? However, most of the other tribes uh, did agree to join the Confederacy pretty quickly. Uh, they assumed guardianship of the tribes, basically re becoming responsible for all the obligations the U.S. Uh, owed to the Indians. The Confederacy said, we will res retake over those uh, responsibilities and the treaties you have with the United States government. So they kind of became guardians of the Indian tribes. So for a little while, uh, Chief Ross, because the Cherokee were the only tribe that really hadn't joined the Confederacy, not wanting to stand alone, uh, met with the Cherokee and 4,000 Cherokee came and the tribe decided to join the Confederate cause. Uh, so Chief Ross reluctantly signed a treaty um, to join the Confederacy. All the while, uh, Stan Wadey, had already begun drilling a group of mixed blood Cherokee to fight for the, the Confederacy on horseback. Okay, so pretty much all the tribes now have a good portion of their uh, tribe fighting for the Confederacy. Um, quickly, you had Confederate Indian fighting re regiments quickly formed uh, and trained. Uh, this would be, like I said, pretty much for all of the tribes. Uh, the Stan Wadey is going to continue to come up, though, because they kind of became almost like an elite fighting force, one of the more difficult ones to deal with. Um, now, there was a group of Creek which resisted joining uh, the uh, cause of the South and the Confederacy. Uh, this was a group of Upper Creek who were led by Ophthiohola, who um, is the leader of this group, the Loyal Creek, and they appealed to the Great Father what they called him, and that was Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, saying they wanted to remain a part of the Union. Uh, included about 6,500 Indians, some from other tribes as well, who would join this regiment of Creek who wanted to stay a part of the Union. Uh, now, you do end up having a couple different battles between the Loyal Creek uh, and the South. Uh, you have one that takes place November 19th, 1861, uh, a regiment led by uh, Confederate Colonel uh, Cooper, who fought against the Loyal Creek uh, um, near Round Mountain, which is near Tulsa today. Uh, neither side claimed victory, so it was kind of a tie. Cooper's forces once again attacked them later on December 9th. The battle also ended in a stalemate, uh, and then Cooper re retreated to Fort Gibson. Uh, eventually, the... Um, the Loyal Creek would kind of have to go off as refugee, refugees. Uh, they could no longer withstand the Confederacy at some point in time. Now, in your book on page 223 is uh, a, a little portion about Ophiola. And an assignment I want you to do for this particular lecture is read that on 223 and just write a short one paragraph um, summarizing what you read there on page 223. Um, the Loyal Indians, obviously, like I said, moved west of Skytook. They eventually 
uh, were finally defeated. The, five, the survivors fled uh, away. Many of them went off into Kansas, which at this point in time was a free uh, state and not a slave state. Now, the first somewhat major battle that happens in Indian Territory is the Battle of Pea Ridge. Uh, once again, this is going to be, now you're going to get actual Union soldiers coming in. Uh, Union forces would win a decisive battle here, it, which took place in northwestern Arkansas and bled a little bit over into Oklahoma. This was in March of 1862. More than 10,000 Union soldiers, commanded by Brigadier General Samuel Curtis, battled 1,600 Confederate soldiers under Major General Oro Van Dorn, uh, and 800 Cherokee troops here also fought under the leadership, once again, of Stan Wadey. It was a fierce battle. After two days of fighting, the Union forces won. 46 Confederates, uh, including one of their leaders, uh, McCullough, lost uh, his life at Pea Ridge compared to 1,400 uh, Union soldiers. So as far as major battles in Oklahoma, this is kind of the first one. There's a lot of other small skirmishes. You also then did be, have the beginning of black soldiers. Uh, after the loss of Pea Ridge, Confederate positions in the West, Union leaders in Kansas summoned troops from all across the United States to fight in Indian Territory. Uh, Union soldiers proceeded to take over Fort Gibson and Tahlequah, uh, and they were, were welcomed by Chief John Ross, uh, who welcomed the Union in. They did send John Ross to Philadelphia, though, for the rest of the war, along with his family, for his safety to keep him safe. Uh, due to some inaction and inaccuracies, the Union did kind of back out of Indian Territory once again and go into Kansas. Black troops became a part of the war. Uh, in May 1861, Frederick Douglass began calling for African Americans to participate in the Civil War. Uh, the Union War Department authorized services of blacks in 1862. Uh, interestingly, James Henry Lane, a senator uh, from the new free state of Kansas, was the first to organize a unit of black soldiers in August of 1862, which was called the First Kansas Colored Infantry. So the first regiment of black troops was actually formed uh, in Kansas, just north of here, uh, and they would fight in Indian Territory during this war. Another battle is the Battle of Cabin Creek. Here, Colonel William Phillips had been left in command of the Union Indian troops in the northwestern part of the territory, in addition to combating Stan Wadey's raids. So Stan Wadey uh, was very involved in guerrilla warfare, raiding in, destroying supplies. Uh, he, didn't, he is going to fight in several battles, but a lot of what he did was just kind of go in, get out with his horse soldiers, uh, you know, strike a little bit of damage, uh, keep troop movement slowed down, uh, keep uh, Union soldiers from hopefully getting supplies that they would often need. Well, encouraged by Phillips, many Union Cherokee met uh, at the Cowson Prairie in northeastern corner of the Cherokee Nation in February of 1863. At this council, the Cherokee withdrew from the Confederacy uh, and declared Stan Wadey and his followers to be outlaws and the Cherokees abolished slavery uh, for their tribe. And they elected John Ross as chief and Thomas Pegg as acting chief, since John Ross, like we said, was still in Philadelphia. So you now had two competing Cherokee governments, and Stan Wadey was now an enemy of this other group of Cherokee. After a bloody battle, the Union infantry held off Wadey's men. The Battle of Cabin Creek was the first in engagement in the Civil War in which black, white, and Indian troops fought side by side. Okay, so the Battle of Honey Springs would be the largest Civil War battle in Indian Territory. Um, the Confederates planned to have uh, a group under Cooper uh, with Indians and Texas regiments join General William Cabal's uh, forces at Fort Smith to force an attack upon Fort Gibson, which was now being held by the Union. Two Confederate forces were hoping to join. On the night of July 15th, he quickly began moving artillery and men across the swollen Arkansas River. The Union leader did. He decides to take action first against the Confederates. Um, they were going to attack a principal Confederate supply depot uh, at Honey Springs. 
Launched 3,000 men, included regiments from a lot of different areas, including the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry. Cooper had 6,000 Confederate troops, which included Wadey and two Cherokee regiments. Uh, a small skirmish started on uh, the morning of July 17th, but the fighting got more intense as time went on. Many Texans were killed. Confederate troops soon had problems with wet gunpowder, which would make their guns uh, un unreliable at best. Uh, they also had inferior artillery. After a two-hour two battle, Cooper's forces retreated. Before they left, uh, they set the storage buildings on fire, hoping that Union could not get the supplies that they had had there. Uh, Blunt later said that the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry fought like veterans with a, cold, a coolness and valor that is unsurpassed. And this would be a common theme amongst uh, other regiments in the other parts of the Civil War as well. The colored regiments or black regiments uh, would oftentimes fight valiantly and they would gain the respect of whites over time, at least inside the Civil War units. Um, so the Battle of Honey, Honey Springs, like I said, largest and bloodiest and most decisive Civil War battle in Indian territory. Uh, once again, a Union victory. These are pretty much all primarily Union victories. Uh, the Battle of Perryville. Um, here, Blunt's mission was to defeat the Confederates in Indian Territory once and for all. Cooper's Indian troops were still dispirited after their defeat at Honey Springs. Blunt attacked the Confederates on August 26, 1863. This is only you know, about a month and a half after Gettysburg. Uh, Blunt found them at Perrysville, a major supply depot for the Confederates. Uh, in a nighttime battle, the Confederates hastily retreated after a short fight, leaving behind supplies. Uh, and Blunt, once he took over the town, ordered it to be burned. Now, as a result of a lot of the fighting going on in Indian Territory, many Indians end up being refugees. Now, sometimes they might be Indians who were loyal to the Confederates, so they would maybe go to Texas or Missouri, um, uh, or maybe even Arkansas. Whereas if they were kind of loyal to the Union, they would end up going to Kansas. I already talked about the Loyal Creek numbering. About 7,000 eventually made their way to refugee camps in Kansas. Uh, but like I said, this would happen. There would be thousands upon thousands of Indians kind of leaving Indian Territory as refugees. You can imagine, too, that women and children would want to leave as much as possible to get away from the war and what was going on. Um, last thing I do want to mention before we end this. Uh, on April 9th, 1865, you had the signing uh, of the document, kind of official. I say kind of, because we're going to talk about something else here in a second, officially ending the Civil War at Appomattox Courthouse uh, when Robert E. Lee uh, basically signed the surrender of the armies of Northern Virginia, which kind of spelled the end for the South uh, as a whole. Uh, obviously, there at Appomattox was Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, the peace treaty that was signed upon was actually very gracious and very forgiving towards the South. Uh, Grant and Lincoln wanted it to be pretty forgiving. They didn't want to punish the South too much. They wanted to kind of get back to the South being a part of the United States. Um, however, some Confederates did not sign on and continued to fight. One of those was Stan Wadey of the Cherokee. He was the last Confederate commander to s surrender. Uh, he gave up his sword at Dokesville June 23rd, 18. 65. So another question I want you to answer is who was the last general to give up his sword and on what date was that? So that's Stan Wadey, June 23rd, 1865. Um, I might ask other questions that I don't mention in the video uh, on, on the, uh, through email, but go ahead and make sure you do that uh, when I post this uh, and after you watch the video. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, once again, hope uh, you know we can continue uh, all getting healthy, staying healthy, and hopefully get life back to normal as soon as possible. And we'll talk to you later. Bye.